speaker is Nicole Gibran. She is a uh, phys professor. She's in fact the director of the University of Washington Regional Burn Center at Harvard Medical Center. Her clinical interests include burns, trauma, critical care, and wound healing, and she focuses her studies on the role of nerves in wound repair. She's also interested in diabetic neuropathy and genomic determinants of patient responses to burn injury. Dr. Gibran has been the principal investigator on multiple NIH-funded research grants and industry-funded clinical trials since 1994. She has earned her, did earn her medical degree from Boston University, where she did her residency at the same university. She uh, completed a burn and intensive care fellowship at the NIH. This was followed by a Northwest Burn Foundation Research Fellowship here at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She is president-elect for the American Burn Association and serves on the board of trustees of the Wound Healing Society. She's asked me to tell everybody that there will be some, maybe some fairly horrific pediatric wounds and burns, which might be a little shocking to some of you. Thank you, Dr. Chabron. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to start by talking just a little bit about the incidence of burns and where we are at the University of Washington. We estimate that nationwide there's about 100,000 patients every year who are injured from, burn in, from burns in the country. And about that's how many patients are hospitalized. We don't really know how many patients sustain burns since many people probably just stay home. We do know that in 1976, which is my bellwether since it was the first year that we had complete data at the University of Washington Burn Center, there were about three deaths for every 100,000 Americans. There were a total of 6,300 de deaths in the United States that year from fire-related burns. And in 2009, which is the last year we have national data, we're down to less than one burn per 100,000 patients. So we've made progress over the last 30 years. In 1977, the University of Washington Burn Center admitted 275 patients. At that time, there were 11 other hospitals in the state that uh, took care of patients with burn injuries. Well, burn care centers also, in my estimation, have contributed to the progress that we've seen with burn survival. We now, with really no other burn centers in the state and no burn centers in the state of Alaska, and uh, also taking care of patients with burn injuries from Montana and Idaho, admit uh, upwards of 900 patients a year. You'll notice that in the last 30 years, see if I can get the pointed work, the burn size has dramatically decreased. In 1977, the average burn size was about 17% of your total body surface area. And in 2010, it was approximately 6%, which means that we have eliminated patients with large burns. We have not eliminated patients with large burns. We have eliminated large burns. And <laughs> that, that, to a great degree, has to do with the fact that we see very few patients with uh, burns due to house fires because patients have uh, carbon monoxide detectors. They have smoke detectors. We have home water heater uh, limitations on the temperature if you have a uh, hot water heater put in your house, it's usually set at 120 degrees until you decide that your shower isn't hot enough and you go down and reset it. So we have made great progress in prevention of serious burns, which is great. You can see that over the last 30 years, in spite of the fact that our 
total numbers of burns has gone up. The numbers of large burns, again, has stayed about the same. And again, the number of patients that we admit with small burns, which are serious because they involve feet, they involve hands, they involve faces, all important areas that are functionally important and cosmetically important, but not life-threatening. Uh, you'll see that our mortality rate has gone down significantly. And I can tell you that of the 23 patients who died in 2010, most of them had burns which were non-survivable because they didn't have any skin to donate from another part of their body to cover the wounds that they uh, had. And you'll understand that a little bit more as we go through the talk. And then the hospital likes us better because our length of stay is dramatically decreased, and that means the cost of care is dramatically decreased. So that's all I'm going to say about burn epidemiology. The rest is going to be about wound healing and about technologies, some that are tried and true and some that are, as uh, you heard, are pipe dreams. You've already seen a diagram of the skin. Let me just repeat that the epidermis because I'll be talking about the different layers. The epidermis, which is your outer layer, is uh, comprised of a basal layer, which is where the regenerative cells are, and then an outer layer, which is known as the stratum corneum, which is really your protective layer. The dermis is where a lot of other goodies are. It's where your blood vessels are. And I'm not so interested in the blood vessels, but I am interested in the nerves. And actually, I'm interested in interactions between the blood vessels and the nerves, because they actually uh, migrate through the skin together, and they uh, talk to each other, which is not something that I will talk about tonight, but which is the focus of my laboratory research. And then at the bottom of the dermis, you have your subcutaneous tissue. And uh, we'll talk about that. So up here uh, in the upper corner, you can see a flame burn. And it is a nice example of a burn because it has all different types of burns. It has in the center a zone of coagulation. You can see it's white, it's dead, it's going to stay dead. Surrounding that, you have a pale area. It would be nice if this pointer would stay in place. A pale area, which is also inflamed. It, the blood vessels are contracted. They're constricted down. It's ischemic, which means it doesn't have any oxygen. And we don't know whether this is going to be viable, meaning living, or whether or not it's going to convert to an area of coagulation like the central portion. If it becomes edematous, then it's likely to convert to a zone of coagulation. Then the outermost layer is what we call the zone of hyperemia. And there, the blood vessels are dilated. They uh, leak a lot of fluid, but they are, the tissue is alive. And unless I really screw up and allow the wound to get infected and the patient allows the wound to get uh, swollen, then that's going to heal on its own. So some examples. Oh, uh, you also can go to 7-Eleven, and you can get first degree, second degree, and third degree Doritos, if you're so inclined. <laughs> so here's a first degree burn. And uh, this is typically a sunburn. This is a patient who was at a tanning booth. I don't recommend them. Uh, it's erythematous. It's very painful. Uh, it's going to heal quickly in three to four days. Basically, patients need reassurance with a little bit of aloe vera and some non-steroidal uh, pain medicines. In contrast, this is a very common pediatric burn. Uh, it results when toddler reaches up and pulls uh, something hot off the counter, grandmother's tea, mom's coffee, something just out of the microwave. The typical distribution hits the chin hits the shoulder, runs down the chest, and into the diaper. You can see that this is uniformly pink. If you touch it, it's going to blanch. It's got blisters that you can see here on the shoulder. It's going to be very moist. It's very painful. And as I said, most likely due to a scald burn. 
we would expect that this burn is going to heal without any scarring in about seven to 10 days. In somebody who has pigment, though, we can't predict whether or not this burn is going to result in pigment changes. Anyone want to guess what caused this burn? Child abuse. You can tell that because in, but behind the knee and in the crease here in the groin, the, it shows evidence of sparing, no burn there. It says the kid was trying to withdraw his knees and uh, prevent uh, contact with the hot water. This is a deeper second degree burn. You can see that it's modeled. If you touch it, it's not going to blanch. It may or may not be painful. It can be due to a scald burn. Often, if this was on the hand, we would think of it maybe as a grease burn. And then a flash burn where you're not caught on fire can also result in a burn like this. I can't tell when this patient is admitted to the hospital whether this is going to heal or whether it's going to require surgery. And what we tell patients is that if it heals in less than 21 days, you're better off without surgery. But if it's going to take more than 21 days to heal, you're better off with surgery because of the risk of scarring. And so we would classify this as a wait and watch. And finally, a full thickness burn or a third degree burn. You can see that it's mostly white or charred. It can be black depending on the type of flame. It's going to be dry. It's going to be leathery. Often actually looks like the sole of your shoe. And when you touch it, it's painless. It can be due to either a contact burn or a flame burn where you've been actually on fire. This burn's not going to heal. And the only thing to do is to cut away the burn and to put a skin graft on. But interestingly enough, even this burn has this central area of zone of coagulation. It has a surrounding area, zone of stasis, and then it has a periphery zone of hyperemia. So even with a full thickness burn, we see all stages of burns. You already heard about the response to healing. And over here, I have a picture of normal skin. You can see it's another way of showing it other than the cartoon. You can see that the epidermis is the thin layer on top. The dermis is the uh, reddish area with lots of different structures. You can see a hair follicle, which is important. You can see some muscle, which is going to cause goosebumps when you uh, are cold. And then you can see on the bottom panel what a scar looks like. You'll see that it has the outer layer of epidermis. It has the dermis, but you'll see it's not normal. It doesn't have the nice uh, waviness of the dermis. It doesn't have the hair follicles. It doesn't have the sweat ducts. And so healing is never normal, even if we call it healed. Today, I'm really just going to focus on epithelialization. And the reason I'm going to focus on epithelialization is that that's what keeps you in the hospital. When we talk about a wound being healed and you can go home, what we're saying is that it's epithelialized. We're no longer worried that you're at risk for bacterial infection because the outer layer of the skin is providing some barrier to bacteria. It's providing a barrier for uh, thermal regulation, and it's providing a barrier that prevents absorption of toxins. <clears throat> this is very important because it involves two processes, keratinocyte, which are the main cells in the epidermis, migration, and proliferation. And here are two examples of types of epithelialization. With a partial thickness wound, you're going to get epithelialization from the hair follicles. The cells migrate up the shaft of the hair follicle, and they form these little goose bumps, which we call skin buds. You can also get uh, skin buds from sweat ducts, which populate the skin. In contrast, here's a full thickness wound, and here's an example of an epithelial tongue that's advancing across the wound. Here's the granulation tissue. And what we predict is that an advancing epithelial tongue can migrate across the wound at about one millimeter per day. But at about 10 days, it peters out. And so we can only expect that the advancing epithelial tongue is going to migrate 
for about one centimeter, which means that any full thickness wound that's bigger than the size of a quarter is going to need some other means of healing. It's either going to contract, meaning shrink down from all those myofibroblasts that Dr. Quigley talked about, or it's going to need a skin graft. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So I'm going to focus on four types of wound therapies today. I'm going to talk about things which are tried and true. I'm going to talk about new standards of care. I'm going to talk about some things that are in the pipeline, which are actually clinical trials that we are involved in here at the University of Washington or about to be involved in. And then I'm going to talk about some pipe dreams. So the standard care of any wound before you make a decision about whether or not it needs surgery is what we call the goût du jour. And that means that whatever the antimicrobial uh, goop that is currently in favor is something that you want to apply to the wound and change it every day. Our favorite is something called silver sulfadiazine. It has some silver in it. It has some sulfa moieties in it. And it has some very good properties. Number one, it's very soothing. It's very cheap, and you can just apply it like frosting. You can actually see uh, this nurse who's got some on her hand as she dips it into the uh, jug of uh, silvadine. An alternative for shallow burns would be bacitracin or neosporin. Neosporin and bacitracin are nice because you don't need to, a prescription for them. You can go to the pharmacy and just get them from there. They uh, are excellent uh, goos for shallow burns. Uh, the problem is that they dry cake, uh, and cake very easily, and so they can be difficult to wash off. There's another one which is Bactroban. And Bactroban, I've noticed, has increasingly been uh, administered in many uh, doctor's offices around town when I bring my own children in to be treated. And I don't like that because Bactroban has one unique feature. It's good against methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And if we continue to use it uh, in a capricious fa fashion, that means that we're going to have more resistance. And so when I have a patient who has a MRSA infection, I'm not going to be able to rely on Bactroban if we continue as a community to be using it for all wounds, whether or not they have MRSA or not. The more you use an antibiotic, the more likely resistance is going to develop, and this is a problem that the medical community has had for the last 30 years, and which is why we have so many resistant bacteria. So silver is a precious metal, and it is an excellent uh, antimicrobial addition to our wound care armamentarium. It was first recognized to have antibacterial properties by the Phoenicians who would store their water and their wine and other fluids in silver jugs to prevent bacterial infection. Hippocrates recognized that it had uh, antibacterial and uh, anti-disease properties, and he actually wrote about it. And in the early 20th century in the United States, people would add a few silver coins to their milk jug to keep their milk fresh. It's really not known why exactly silver has such good antimicrobial properties. But uh, about um, 15 years ago, a company in Canada came out with, it was not a wound care company. It was actually a company that was trying to find uses for silver. And they came out with a dressing that was impregnated with silver. And you can see it here. It's known as Actacoat. And they found that uh, most bacteria were very sensitive to it. There is one city in this country where bacteria are resistant to silver. Who would like to tell me what that city is? No. <laughs> what? Reno, Nevada. No, not Reno, Nevada. Who's from back east? Providence, Rhode Island. No, not Providence, Rhode Island. New York not New York City, but you're getting warmer. It's in the state of New York. No. No. 
Not Syracuse. Rochester. Who said Rochester? Tell me why. Kodak. And Kodak makes film. And Kodak has a lot of silver effluent. And so the bacteria develop resistance to the silver. So uh, over the last years, we have uh, evolved. And uh, every time the burn center seems to introduce a new dressing, and we like it, and we think that we have found our own little secret, uh, everybody else in the hospital discovers it, because I think the residents say, oh, they're not using Acticode anymore. They're using something else. And so now the latest fad is a new silver dressing, which is more like a mouse pad. My colleague actually describes it to patients like a mouse pad. It's foam-like, and it actually has adhesive on one side of the dressing, and so it sticks to the wound. And so you can take a children's scald burn like this. You can apply this dressing to it, wrap it up with a little gauze, and take it off 10 days later without the need for a daily dressing change, and you've got a nicely healed wound. You heard about the wound vac. We have, uh, in the past, looked at the wound vac for healing of burn wounds. And we found that with hand wounds, for instance, we were able to decrease the swelling, which we thought helped with the healing. And we were also, we thought, able to uh, decrease the numbers of surgeries that we did on the patients. Uh, it hasn't become standard of care for us, I think, because this is so um, awkward to evaluate the wound repeatedly, and it really requires that patients stay in the hospital and uh, be hooked up to the uh, wound vac. It's one thing to be able to have a wound vac on your leg and drive, but it's another thing to have it on your hands. Uh, <clears throat> we have used it both um, preoperatively. Here's a patient who has a very deep contact burn to his hand. You can see the exposed tendon. Uh, we put a wound vac on this, and we were able to get the granulation tissue to cover that whole wound, which allowed us to put a skin graft on it. We then put uh, the wound vac on top of the skin graft, which helps immobilize the graft, immobilize the wound. It decreases the chance that there are any uh, collections of fluid underneath the skin graft. It improves graft take. And here you can see he has a nice result where you, without the wound vac, that finger may actually have to be amputated. So the wound vac has also been helpful for uh, burn wounds. So make no mistake. If there has been one intervention in the past uh, 30 years that has moved burns along, it is early excision and skin grafting of burn wounds. It's, nothing, it's no dressing. It's no goo. It's nothing that I've talked about yet. Early excision and grafting decreases infection. It improves results, decreases the need for reconstruction, decreases scarring, decreases hospitalization, length of stay, and in short, uh, has better outcomes. You can see in this chart where the y-axis represents the size of a burn that's associated with a 50% survival. In 1940, when penicillin was first introduced, a 30% burn had a 50-50 chance of making it. Lots of interventions, broad-spectrum antibiotics, burn centers, refined resuscitation, better nutrition, maybe inching up a little bit, but not really dramatic. Early excision and grafting was introduced in the late 70s in this country, and by the mid-80s, we began to see a substantial rise in survival after burn injuries to the point where now at our burn center and most burn centers around the country, a patient with a 70% burn has a 50-50 chance of making it. And this is all due to early excision and grafting. So 30 years ago, this might be what the results that you could anticipate. Poor range of motion, poor scarring, poor uh, range of motion here in a child. You can see complete contracture of this patient who's unable to move his neck, unable to eat now because his mouth and his jaw are so uh, malformed. And 
In contrast, this is one of the first patients that was excised and grafted at the University of Washington, a young child. You can see she had skin grafts placed, all, all that burn was cut away, and she came back for a minor aesthetic question many years later. She's got normal breast development, and if the picture would show it, she has full range of motion in her um, shoulders. So that, I think, is a good result. Here's an example of a patient with a face burn. Uh, the entire thing needed to be cut away. And you can see, again, a perfectly nice result. She does have some scars, which are unavoidable. But she certainly uh, can go out into public and be presentable. Again, this is a patient who's African American. And many patients who have significant pigment in their skin have difficulty with scarring. And you can see, even in this patient, a very acceptable result. And you can see that the areas where the skin grafts were are very nice without any significant scarring. Contrast those to the pictures that uh, I showed you before. Over time, we have learned from our mistakes. We've learned how to do our surgeries with less blood loss, and that means that we need less blood transfusions. That's a good thing. We've learned that sheet grafts are better than meshed grafts. You'll see some meshed grafts later in the uh, talk. We've improved our dressings, some of those I've already talked to you about. And we've begun to introduce artificial skin, and I'll talk about that. So, in excising a burn wound, uh, there's really nothing sexy about it. You need to cut away the dead tissue, and our tools are really quite rudimentary, nothing sexy. We basically are using knives and cutting away the dead tissue to normal bleeding tissue. Big blades, little blades. However, we have introduced some new technologies similar to the type of instrument that is used to cut granite we can use a water dissector, which sends a very high-powered plume of water across a small uh, area of this wand, and it actually can cut tissue away. It is uh, very good for specific parts of the body. It's great for this hand, where it would be hard to get one of those imprecise metal tools in. It's great for the fingers. It's great for the eyelids. It's great for small areas of contoured tissue. There is a st steep learning curve. And unlike the blades, which I just showed you, which are pennies, this tool costs $500. And so I'm very selective when I decide to use it, because it certainly is a uh, health cost. Whenever you cut away that tissue, you need to cover it with something. And skin grafting is how we do it. Many people ask whether or not it's possible to donate skin for a relative. And that really isn't possible unless you have an identical twin. Not a fraternal twin, but an identical twin. Otherwise, you'll reject it. And so we harvest skin from an uninjured part of the patient's same body. You can see uh, here we're taking a piece of skin. It looks a little bit like a fancy cheese slicer. Um, but it's air powered. And you can see the skin actually being lifted off the uh, patient's uh, body. We ideally would like to place that on the wound just as it is. But if necessary, we can put it through a roller and we can mesh it. And we can then expand it. It's a little bit like when you pull fishnet stockings out of the package. They initially look like they're just regular shears. But once you put them on the leg, the bigger you expand them, they're going to expand even more. So we can actually expand the skin graft a little bit, or we can expand it a whole lot. And so depending on the amount of skin that we need, we do exactly that. Here's what the skin looks like when it comes off the body. If you take a very shallow piece of skin, four one thousandths of an inch, you're going to actually miss the bottom of the epithelium. And that's a bad thing, because remember I told you that's where the regenerative cells are. And so if we want that skin graft to live, then we're going to need to have the bottom of the epithelium. If you take it too thick, it's going to take longer for your donor site to heal. And you may have scarring in your donor site. Uh, and then. If you take it just right, you have a little bit of dermis, and you have all of the bottom of your uh, epithelium. 
And so you want it a little bit like um, Goldilocks, not too thin and not too thick. You just want it just right. So how do we get that skin graft to stick on the wound bed? Here you can see some staple sites. They are great for getting that skin graft to stay in place. But the fact of the matter is, is they cause really ugly scars. And these little areas, which uh, seem angry now, are going to end up being scars later. So staples are tried and true, but they're really ugly. So fibrin, it circulates in your body. And actually, it circulates as fibrinogen. And then it's cleaved at a wound site to become fibrin, which becomes part of the clot. Well, it's possible, actually, to put fibrinogen in one tube and to put the enzyme that cleaves it in another tube. And when you spray it on the wound like an atomizer, you can get a nice clot on the top of your wound. And that's one of the ways we get hemostasis or blood clotting in the operating room when we're doing our surgery. But the other advantage is, is that it's sticky. And so it helps our grafts stick, and it helps our grafts adhere and it decreases the chance that there will be any collections under the skin grafts after the surgery. And so this is something that I think is one of the best uh, introductions for improving our ability to do good surgery in the past 10 years. Another thing that helps us with uh, avoiding staples is good old tape. And Hypofix is one particular type of tape that is extra sticky. And we can, instead of using staples, we can actually tape the wounds. And you can see that we can use it on a palm. We can use it on the back of a hand. We can use it on a foot. We can even use it on a very contoured area like a chin or a face. All of these areas are places that Hypofix works. Donor sites, the areas that we take the skin grass from, also are an area that have been uh, very problematic. In the old days, we used gauze. It's uh, impregnated with a red dye that's antimicrobial. But it turns out that everything you touch is smeared with red grease. It gets your bedclothes red. It gets your pajamas red. It's really quite disgusting. There are burn centers who still use this. The advantage is it's cheap. Uh, Acticoat was a big advance for donor sites, and we felt strongly that it decreased our infections. But the, then again, I like Mepilex AG, the uh, mouse pad, better because it sticks and it uh, is more comfortable for the patient. Other options, uh, beta-glucan, which uh, every mother in the room whose children have had uh, chicken pox knows that putting them in an oatmeal bath is a good way to decrease the itch, itch and to uh, make the patient more comfortable. Basically, beta-glucan is the active ingredient in oatmeal. It also comes in yeast, and it's been uh, extracted, and it's been put into a gel, which is very soothing for some shallow burns. Uh, it's been put into a moisturizer, which is also quite soothing for uh, patients who have itch. Uh, it turns out that it does have antimicrobial factors, and they have put it in a dressing that can be used, again, as a donor site dressing. This is a child on whom we placed the beta-glucan. We adhered it with the hypofix that I just showed you, and you can see on post-operative day 10, she's completely healed. So in 2011, what are our challenges with large burn wounds? We know that uh, we like to treat small burns with sheet grafts because they're aesthetically superior. In my burn center, a burn that's uh, less than 20% will usually also be treated by a sheet graft because they are aesthetically superior. By the time we get to a burn that is 20 to 30 percent of your body, we're running out of donor site, and so we're going to have to use meshed grafts. And then if we have a patient who has a 40 percent burn or more, that's getting tough, and we're going to be having limited donor sites, and we need to figure something else out. So what do we do? That's where skin substitutes come into play. And there are two types of skin substitutes. One is synthetic dermis, and one is, is cultured epidermis. Obviously, the dermis replaces the inner layer of the skin, and the epidermis replaces the outer layer. Both are good when you have limited donor sites. 
Synthetic dermis is going to decrease scar formation. Cultured epidermis really is not going to do that because the scars and all of the remodeling that happens occurs in the dermis. Both require fastidious surgical care. They both act like your wound is an agar bed and bacteria love both of them. So you have to be very precise and very careful and have very good infection control. Uh, cultured epidermis has been notoriously associated with per, poor graft take and it requires patients to be mummied like this for weeks because if they bend too much it will shear and then it has to be regrafted and so that ends up delaying rehabilitation and prolonging length of stay. So in 1980 uh, a chemist at MIT and a burn surgeon at Harvard uh, developed a two-layer uh, membrane, which they called a dermal template, and it was made of bovine or cow collagen, and then another protein, which is in your skin, which they collected from shark, and then they covered it with a silastic membrane, and that was to mimic the epidermis. And after many studies, it's been shown that there is no risk of uh, rejection. So you would take a wound here that you see the defect of the wound. You would put this bilaminate uh, product in the wound. In two weeks, the patient's own fibroblasts and the blood vessels would migrate in there. And then you could take a very, very thin layer of the patient's own skin, a much thinner layer than you ordinarily would take and place it on top of the silastic, so, or excuse me, on top of the skin graft. And so here it is again, another example. Here's the dermal matrix, here's the silastic. Uh, you'd see the blood vessels migrating in. Seven days, there are some cells migrating in. At 14 days, more, it's become vascularized because of all the angiogenesis that has gone on. At that point, you can remove the silastic you could put a meshed skin graft on it, and then within about three weeks, that would be regenerated, and it would, because this is such a thin skin graft, it would heal with less obvious scarring. You can see at the bottom, this is an example on your left side of what the new dermis looks like when you use the artificial skin template. We've managed to collect a junction here where you can see the scar, the mat of tissue, and juxtaposed you see the integra, which is the artificial skin, and on either side of it. And you can see that the integra is associated with a much more basket weave type of architecture compared to the mat of scar in the middle that we caught at that junction. Here's one example that uh, we have. This is a 45-year-old male. Who wants to guess what the gender breakdown is of my patients at the burn center? 75% male. So what about for kids less than five years old? What do you think? Who wants to guess 50-50? 50-50? Not many takers, a few takers? 60% men or 60% boys. So here you have a 45-year-old male uh, who threw accelerant on a bonfire, very common. Don't laugh, it's very common. Uh, he has a bad hand burn. This is a full thickness burn. We had to excise the burn. We placed Integra on it. You can see this Integra is pink. It's supposed to look like shrimp or salmon. And here you can see us peeling off the silastic. Here you can see that he has full range of motion because at five days after his initial surgery, I allowed our therapist to start ranging him. Here's a beautiful sheet graft that we applied. And here are his hands one year after his burn. You can barely tell that they have been injured and he has full range of motion. He's actually a firefighter who um, does fire jumping for forest fires and he's back to uh, his trade. Here's another example. This is a nine-year-old girl who was playing with a match, and she has uh, full thickness burns to her torso and her uh, both upper extremities, her arms, 50% burn. Here we are cutting away the burn in the operating room, 
And I told you that uh, the subcutaneous tissue is important. This burn actually was so deep that we had to cut it away, not with those other tools that you saw, but actually with uh, cautery. And we're cutting away the burn tissue here down to a healthy wound bed that's viable. Here she is with the Integra placed just after her surgery. And now she's had her skin grafting, and she's seven days after her skin grafting. You can see the meshed pattern of the skin underneath this thin dressing that she has in place. Here she is two months still in the hospital. You can see that still the meshed pattern is evident. She still has a few scattered open wounds. Mostly what she's working on now is exercising and rehabilitation. And here she is, ready to be discharged 85 days after her burn. She's been in the hospital one and a half days, basically, for every percent burn that she had. Uh, she was playing with a match. And here she is, six months after injury. Uh, she has barely visible donor sites, full range of motion, really quite nice result and she's beginning to mature her scars. Remember, it takes about 18 months to completely mature and remodel all of your scars. And really, by uh, six months with the Integra, she has made good progress with that uh, remodeling. The other uh, synthetic skin are cultured epithelial cells. These were first described in 1984. Uh, we have used them in limited uh, we have used them really in a limited uh, indications at the University of Washington because uh, we felt that they were really introduced before they were technologically ready for prime time. You can see here, though, in one patient that we used them on, uh, we are taking them out of their culture medium. We're applying them to a torso of a young child. And then two weeks later, you can see some of them have taken, and again, as I told you, uh, about 60% uh, graft take, which is not our um, standard of care. We really would prefer to have greater than 90% graft take. So those are tried and true and things that are standard of care. I'm going to switch now and talk to you about some things that are actually in the pipeline. The first one that I'm going to talk about is a combination of the synthetic dermis and the cultured epithelium. And I call this voice skin because the person who developed it is uh, a skin biologist in Cincinnati by the name of Steve Boyce. And what he has developed is uh, a system where he can take a biopsy from a patient and he can isolate and culture the cells, separate out the keratinocytes, the melanocytes, which are your pigment cells, the endothelial cells, which are your blood vessel cells, and your fibroblasts, which are your dermis cells. And he grows those up for two weeks. And then he takes a scaffolding, which is very similar to the dermal template that I showed you already, and he repopulates it. He populates the scaffold itself with the fibroblasts and the endothelial cells from the patient. And he then takes the melanocytes and the keratinocytes and he puts them on the surface of the scaffolding. And then over the next few weeks, he grows these up and he sends them to you so that you can apply them to the patient. And so in some areas, you can have the cultured cells or what he calls his engineered skin substitute. And in other areas, you can have mesh grafts or sheet grafts as needed. Here are uh, examples of the fibroblasts, the keratinocytes, the endothelial cells, and the melanocytes all growing. And you can see the morphology of these are all different. Here's an example of what the histology of his product looks like. Here's the epidermis, which has had a chance to stratify or grow multiple layers in culture. It's had a chance to lay down roots into the dermal substitute while the pit while the cells are growing in culture. And here you can see what it looks like just before it's being applied to a patient. Here's an example of a child that uh, was treated at Cincinnati. You can see down here at the bottom of the abdomen, it's an area that was treated with autograft. 
And here's an area on his torso that was treated with the engineered skin substitute. And this is a 94% burn. This is something that uh, is marginally survivable without a skin substitute. Now, it doesn't, it's not perfect. You can see that this is a child who, even though the skin substitute was populated with the patient's melanocytes, this is a patient who uh, does not have normal pigment in the areas that were grafted. And 10 years later, they still don't have any pigment, which means that this therapy would not be ideal for a an aesthetically important place like the face or the hands. As a life-saving measure, it certainly is brilliant, but for aesthetics, it's not ideal. And so we clearly need to make more progress. So that's one study that uh, we are hoping, that, that product has only been used in children, and we have been selected at the University of Washington to be a site to test it in adults. And so in about the next six to 12 months, we're going to be starting a trial in which we uh, see whether or not that's an effective therapy for adults. Here's a different uh, therapy uh, to cover skin, and this is, uh, we'll see if we can hear this video treatment of skin defects. Biopsies can be obtained using a dermatome or guarded knife. The biopsy must be a thin, split thickness graft, approximately 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters thick. A 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter biopsy will treat 80 centimeters squared. A 2 centimeter by 2 centimeter biopsy will treat 320 centimeters squared. Place the biopsy into the incubator. Next, place the biopsy on the sterile tray and complete the separation of the epidermis and dermis. Scrape the cells from the junctional surface of both skin layers with a sterile scalpel. This technology was developed in Australia, hence the accent. Using a new sterile 5 mil syringe, Draw up the plume of cells and aspirate several times. Now filter the solution and cells. Remove the filter, then draw up the cell suspension. Apply the cells to the wound bed and biopsy site. The spray applicator is used for larger areas. A blunt needle is used for smaller areas. Apply a primary dressing to the wound that is fine pore, non-adherent, low absorption, non-toxic to keratinocytes. Always refer to the instructions for use before using resale. Many of you may have seen the National Geographic uh, show at the beginning of February in which they uh, touted the skin gun. That's a similar technology, a little more macho, but uh, you can see that this uh, device looks a little bit more sensitive or at least uh, technolo technologically savvy than our little spray device, but uh, it's basically the same technology. So the classic wound repair paradigms 
is based on the idea that wounds are going to migrate in from the edges of the wound or from uh, close proximity. But recently, we have had ideas that maybe stem cells that are circulating or stem cells from the bone marrow may contribute to wound repair. And <clears throat> you may have heard of clinical trials that are ongoing around the country using stem cells to treat all sorts of different diseases and clinical entities, including wounds. But one of the things that we've been concerned about, just as we were concerned that the cultured epithelial cells hit the market too soon, is introducing a technology without fully understanding how stem cells may respond in different environments. And my colleague who works with me in the lab, uh, Dr. Hawking, has been studying the effects of diabetes on stem cells. And specifically, she's been looking at the effect of fatty acids. Patients who have diabetes not only have elevated glucose levels, but they also have hyperlipidemia, or ev elevated fatty acid levels. And you can see in this uh, set of experiments, you can see normally proliferating stem cells. And then you can see cells that have been exposed to elevated levels of linoleic acid, which is a commonly found uh, fatty acid in foods, and it's also prevalent in your body, and then also oleic acid. And both of these inhibit proliferation of stem cells. So something's happen happening in the diabetic environment even if you add those stem cells to a patient's wound or administer them systemically, that's going to alter how they behave. <coughs> In another set of experiments, she exposed the cells to linoleic acid and oleic acid and induced them to differentiate into bone. And you can see that when they're exposed to linoleic acid, they have less differentiation abilities, but when they're exposed to oleic acid, they have far more likelihood of forming bone. What are the implications of that? Well, you want to know that if you're going to be administering a therapy such as stem cells to a patient, you want to know how they're going to home to the site that you want them to be at. You want to know how they're going to respond at that site. And you certainly don't want them forming extra bone if you expect them to be in the artery, for instance. If you think that you're going to be using stem cells, for, for instance, to treat uh, heart disease, you certainly would not want those stem cells in the presence of high lipid levels to be forming plaque or calcium in your blood vessels that line your heart. Similarly, we wouldn't want bone formation in wounds. And so I think that before we start introducing such therapies, we need to understand how they uh, behave under normal conditions. Okay, one last slide, pipe dreams. Nanotechnology has allowed us to dream of things such as detecting glucose in wounds, so we can know when patients with diabetes are having glucose flares, or maybe when the wound is becoming infected, or maybe being able to deliver antibiotics, or pain medicine, or insulin, or growth factors, or even stem cells to a wound. And so the idea of developing a smart dressing is something that many researchers, especially bioengineers, are beginning to think about. We've been collaborating with a bioengineer here at the University of Washington, and this is what we've come up with as a smart dressing. Now you'll notice that it's three inches big, and it's certainly uh, just a prototype at this point, but it clearly is not ready for prime time because I don't think anybody is going to want that clunky thing with that gross piece of metal hanging around their wound at this point. And so stay tuned, and maybe in 10 years we will have uh, a smart dressing that can do all of these things. So my ideal wound dressing would meet five things. It would be long-acting. It would be easy to apply, and it would be transparent so that I could see the wound. It would be antimicrobial, so it thwarts infection. It would be analgesic, so the patient doesn't have pain. And it would promote healing. And oh, by the way, 
it would be affordable, which none of those are likely to have. And so to quote Aerosmith, I guess I'm going to have to dream on. Thank you very much. I'd like to know how you determine when you can start range of motion exercises. For our patients who are not post-operative, they are ranged from the first day that they are in the hospital. Uh, we admitted a patient last night with a 40% burn, and today my therapists were working with him. For a patient that has a skin graft, I generally immobilize them for five days to allow the graft to take. Uh, I, with the f use of fibrin sealant, the glue that I showed you, I'm more likely to allow them to mobilize a little bit earlier, but by about five days, the graft is adherent enough so that I can start mobilizing them. And that means full range of motion. And I can assure you that my therapists are on my back every day. When can we move them? When can we move them? Because our standard of care is to get patients up moving as quickly as possible. No lying around in bed on our burn service. Bioprinting is, I guess, a technology where they're using like laser jet printing to print cell layers down. I, yeah. Can any of you speak on that technology? Uh, it's certainly not, not clinically um, active yet, but it's. Um, I probably could have used, I could have talked about it a little bit, but the idea is that you can use a device which is similar to a um, inkjet printer in your house, and you can actually recreate skin or any other organ, to be honest. They've thought about it in other areas as well, but you can deliver uh, in a random motion melanocytes and uh, uh, keratinocytes and actually build a skin layer. This is something which is experimental now and I don't think anybody is using it on humans. I think it's still actually uh, proof of concept and may actually have made it to um, the animal model uh, level. But um, I, re I reviewed a manuscript um, about a year ago in which they were describing it as a proof of concept. But I think that's an exciting in the pipeline, or maybe pipe dream technology, which would be certainly very beneficial for our patients. So thank you very much. Thank you.